Good evening, friends at the Hillary Institute. I hope you're having a good time, and my brief is to talk for 10 minutes or so on why I think we're in danger of winning the carbon war. And this is for three main reasons. I see three emerging megatrends, any one of which is capable of achieving great change in society in the direction that we want things to go if we're to survive the climate threat. But I think all three together, as they interact with each other, are really profound and, and they're imposing on the world a great global energy transition, which if it keeps going with the kind of momentum we've been seeing over the last year or so, uh, can put us in a position to actually get where we want to be with dealing with climate change, or as I put it, win the carbon war. Everything I talk about, I chronicle in my book, my serialized monthly free download book called The Winning of the Carbon War. Uh, and I'm writing that because, you know, I'm in a pr privileged position as a sort of bit part player in the great drama of climate change. To be sitting in the front row watching things happen, um, I'm a bit of a participant, obviously not a major one, but I see all these dramas unfold and I'm really aware, talking to people in my vocation, that not everyone has the privilege that I have, both of that and the three or four hours every day to follow all the detail of what's going on. So let me distill it down into the guts of my argument. The three emerging megatrends are the cost down of the insurgency technologies and industries, the cost up generally of the incumbency technology and uh, technologies and industries, and the fact that key players, both state actors and non-state actors, are beginning to get deadly serious on multiple fronts about really dealing with this problem. So, a bit of why I'm so cautiously optimistic based on what I'm seeing. I mean, the cost down in solar, for example, um, one of my creations is a middleweight solar company called Solar Century, so I see this on the front lines. The cost down has taken everybody by surprise, even the most enthusiastic advocates like myself. One set of analysts calls it the terror dome because of the steepness of the cost down since 2006, uh, and you know, they're referring they're referring to the terror dome because it resembles a fairground ride, but also because of the terror that it strikes into the, uh, into the hearts of people who would seek to defend incumbency technologies against that. And it's not just solar, it's not just other generation technologies, it's storage technologies increasingly, and that's spilling over into motive power. So we have all discovered recently that Apple intends to be mass producing solar charged battery cars by 2020, just five years from now. And this is a microcosm of what's going on across the piece now. And we're seeing the first big energy companies actually begin to do 180 degree U-turns in their business plans as a result of this. E.ON, Germany's biggest utility, was the first to go. The second to go was GDF Suez. That's even rebranded re itself as it's repositioned totally to focus on uh, growth and profitability in clean energy technologies like E.ON in the developed world. So these are the first two utilities. There will be more, there will have to be more because their business models don't work anymore. Uh, and this is true also of the oil and gas industry. The quicker we get into electricity as the main fuel of the future, the more they're going to be at risk of you know, really profound stranded assets uh, if they persist with their business models. And it's my bet that within a few years we'll see the first oil and gas uh, company join the utilities. Statoil has already set up its first renewable energy division um, and uh, Total, the French oil giant, uh, has already invested hundreds of millions in solar. So in parallel with this, we have the incumbency cost up. And here you've just got to go and take some snapshots of the frontiers of where uh, oil and gas companies are trying to get oil and gas out of the ground increasingly at costs which they can't even match with the prices they can sell the products for. So we've seen Shell pull out of the Arctic. We've seen Shell and other majors lose billions in the shale. We see 
all the drillers the, in, the, in the shale belt in the United States clocking up debts that are now approaching a quarter of a trillion dollars. And right now, this month, many of those drillers are facing credit line reviews by the banks. So this, is, this has a whiff of subprime about it. There's not as much money involved, but it, it has a whiff of that kind of dysfunctional aspect of modern capitalism where these people with flawed, failing, dying business models are able to go to Wall Street and get all this junk debt. And that has to stop, and I think it will stop by natural selection, as it were. Coal, Goldman Sachs concluding the other day that, that coal is in terminal decline. This is not just a climate policy issue and a stranded assets issue. This is a Chinese air quality and other air quality in other uh, countries issue. So uh, the incumbency, even without climate change, is facing a very gloomy set of prospects. And of course, those prospects are being made um, more uh, daunting with every action that we hear about from the policy front. I think this last year we've seen the fact that the Americans and the Chinese have been negotiating bilaterally despite all their difficulties and many other areas of, of, of international affairs on climate change for a long time now. And their uh, bilateral agreement to push the climate negotiations to the success we want to see from the Paris Climate Summit in December. Um, I know from the front lines is really rubbing off on other governments in a positive way. Um, so that the foot draggers now are increased like Australia, Britain, sadly, um, are increasingly being isolated. And it's not just the governments. I don't think the governments could bring home the, uh, the result we want just on their own. It's all the other players. So, for example, the front-running corporates now, um, despite the evidence of um, misbehavior and worse by the likes of Volkswagen <laughs> recently, we, we see companies like IKEA with uh, the intent and the actions in train to 100% renewably power their operations on a global basis by 2020, just five years from now. And as they like to point out, um, if every corporation in the world did that, um, we, w we wouldn't have a climate problem any longer. Well, they're not about to be as, uh, as profound as IKEA, but it is a fact that of the top 100 companies, uh, 52 of them are actually now um, broadly in favor of action and doing things that are consistent with staying ultimately below the danger level of two degrees. And this is the first time in my life of more than a quarter of a century we've been anything like um, that close to the right kind of corporate beha behavior. I think it's only going to get better as people see their brands benefit and the brands of the people who do the stupid things like Volkswagen have done with their criminal activities and Shell with their legal activities, but uh, which clearly in the case of uh, the Arctic go against the wishes and concerns of so many people around the world, not least many of their investors, because they're drilling at such a high cost and can't ever hope to sell the oil even if they, they find it. This, this kind of thing is all going to come together, I hope. I hope I'm not guilty of wishful thinking here, and that we will see a, um, an outcome in Paris that really will set us on what I think of uh, and write about as a road to renaissance. Because this isn't just about counting emissions, bean counting, and regulating uh, their reduction to stay below two degrees Celsius. This is about how we run our societies. And the, the feedback loops when we have clean energy are so profound and cover so many aspects of uh, the things that are wrong with that world, that I think Renaissance is, is exactly the right, the right word to use. Um, and here, I think another factor that is important to mention is the intervention of religious leaders led by, of course, Pope Francis. This new dynamic that we've seen with the papal encyclical this year has yet to, uh, I think, um, 
be revealed and its full implications. But if you look at the way this man, the leader of um, a, a religious group of more than a billion people on the planet, is being received both by conservative Catholics in his own church and by non-Catholics, uh, people like myself, um, I think that this is a, a very important way that we can get to Renaissance because at the end of the day we're not going to bean count our way there, we're not going to shop our way there. There has to be a component of thinking of the future in terms of prosperity that means something uh, beyond simple calculations as to whether we use coal or solar power. So I hope that's been an interesting addition uh, to your evening and Thank you very much for listening to me.